Hello, everybody. Welcome to Airsoft Mechanics Podcast, Episode 9. This is, like I said, Episode 9, and we haven't recorded in quite some time. We've all been super busy, uh, Ryan and I, so I've been gone for four weeks, and he's been uh, getting used to having a, his new job, his internship, so we've been having to get adjusted to uh, having much less time than we've had before. And uh, if you haven't noticed, we have renamed the podcast from the Airsoft Tech Podcast to Airsoft Mechanics Podcast. Uh, the reason why we did this was because the Airsoft Tech Podcast seemed a little too, uh, like, one-sided. It just it, it sounded like it was just me doing it, I guess you could say. And uh, that's not true at all. A lot of work in, that's put into this podcast is also done by, you know, Ryan Fisher. So, you know, we, but we, we both put a lot of work into it, so... We changed the name to something that's a little bit more, uh, like, group-oriented sounding, I guess you could say. And today we have a special guest, Jacob Bell from Nashville Airsoft. I'm special. He's special. <laughs> Very he's, special. He's my battle boo. <laughs> so, uh, we're just going to plunge right into a basically uh, same outline as before. We'll start off with our recent builds. We'll move on to our product review of the week and then we'll move on to our short debate slash discussion and then we'll finish up with a Q&A session. So I'll start off with the recent builds. Uh, recently I have not been doing a whole lot because I just got back from a four week vacation and uh, that's pretty much it. But uh, while I was gone, I well yeah not to take that back, not, like when I was gone and I was in Nashville I was actually at uh, Jacob's house for a week. And I worked on my DSG a bunch, and so I replaced the 18 to 1 G and G spur and bevel with uh, 10 to 1 bevel and spur for, for siege deck. So obviously upping my speed, I'm getting around 50 RPS or so on that. I have an M170 spring getting around 300 FPS. It's a really worn out M170 spring, and uh, that's really all I've changed. But uh, that's really all the teching I've done in the past four weeks because I've been everywhere. Um, but Today, I'm actually working on motors, or I was. It's a customer who sent me, like, ten motors, and uh, it's just, like, a bunch of random thrown-together parts of motors he had, and he asked me to, like, build them all back up into motors. So I'm having to build back all these motors, and that's pretty cool. It's a little different than what I normally do, because I'm always working on guns or, like, mags, so it's cool to work on just motors. But, yeah, that's really all the things I've been doing recently, so I'll just throw it on over to Jacob. Well, like Ryan said, uh, he was over at my house recently, and while he was working on his gun, I was working on one of mine at the exact same time, and in the end, we actually both ended up with almost identical setups. Uh, I've got a GMP here with a retroarm split shell. He was running a normal retroarm shell, but we both had BTC Spectre MOSFETs, uh, Siege Tech 10 to 1 gears, 32 TPA motors. Uh, only difference with mine is that I was running a 14.8 instead of his 11.1. So I was getting around 63 rounds a second, just because, you know, got to go fast. Vroom, vroom. Yeah, pretty much. Right. And, uh, but other than that, I haven't been working on too much. I'm about to start another build with a Mad Bull JP body kit and a cradle billet box gearbox shell, but I'm not entirely sure what I want to do with that yet. So, Ryan, what are you up to? Yeah, and then I haven't really been doing too, too much teching. I've been doing more prepping of my rifles. So, like Ryan said, I've been kind of getting adjusted to my new job and my new schedule in life and um, kind of hectic. I'm also in the whole college process crap and all that kind of stuff. So, my time has been spent. But, um, actually, I will be testing one of the retro arm split gear boxes for the Retro Arms design team because, as I'm sure Jacob and Ryan can both tell you, there were a lot of problems with the actual design of the boxes, and um, I was lucky enough to snag one to review for them and to test and basically to um, affirm, is probably the right word, all of the problems the community has been reporting about and tell them what the problem is, exactly what they need to change to fix the problem, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm prepping one of my rifle, actually my GMP DSG for that, and I'm also prepping my SCAR rifle, which is the one I kind of put in the back burner for a couple of years. Um, that's going to be turned into my second DSG build um, when I get around to it. So I'm starting the process of kind of taking that apart and gutting it and getting it ready to be rebuilt again. Um, but yeah, other than that, I haven't really been doing much, just prepping. Like today... 
I had, I was complaining to Ryan and Jacob earlier. I had to um, take my GMP apart, and previously I locked tighted the um, rail to the upper receiver, and I wasn't paying attention when the Loctite was drying, so the Loctite from the upper receiver threads actually dripped down into the front pin on my receiver, and I, I did this a while ago, and I didn't really come back to the rifle and look at it again because I, I had no reason to open it up. So today I went to open it up to get ready for the um, RA beta shell I was um, testing for them, and I just couldn't get the pin out. And it took me about 10 minutes to realize that there was um, a trail of red Loctite going from the upper receiver threads in the barrel nut all the way down to the front pin. And after about an hour and a half of heating the pin up and just hammering it out, I finally was able to get the receivers apart. And I'm amazingly surprised that I did not snap my receivers, actually, because I got to the point where I was so frustrated with it, I was just hitting it as hard as I possibly could with anything I could find. Um, and then I finally fixed that, and due to all the hammering, my outer barrel came loose in my receiver, so I just had to go through and fix that. And it's basically been a headache all night, but like I got it set, it's working now, and the gun is prepped to test the shell out, so I'm all set with that. Um, next topic I think we're going to talk about is the reviews. So this week, we're going to split it up a bit. We have a couple of different things we can talk about, but um, I think the first thing we can talk about, because we we all either have experience or we're going to have experience, is with the um, RA version 2 split shells. So I will let Ryan and Jacob take that. All right. Um, I actually let Jacob go first, since he's got a uh, pretty good comprehensive uh, grasp on since he owns it. And then I'll just kind of like jump right, like right along with what he's saying, because all the experiences he had are the identical ones, you know, I had too because I was working on it with him, so. Yeah, I got that split shell recently, uh, I think about a month or two ago, and only about a month ago I actually got around to putting it in a gun, and honestly, I've had more trouble with it than it's worth. Um, for example, there was a, uh, the ridge at the top of the gearbox is too high for most charging handles, so you can't, like, so far I've only been able to fit my uh, GMP charging handle into it. And that's just kind of, like, it's, it just has a whole lot of problems that it really shouldn't have. Another problem with it was, I'm pretty sure they, I don't know what kind of anodizing process they use, I don't really know too much about that, but there's a whole lot of parts of it that fit too tightly. For example, the rear portion uh, that fits into the lower half of the gearbox shell and the upper portion where the rear body pin goes in, I don't really know what you'd call that. Uh, basically that's too thick, so whenever you have the screws in the lower half of the shell and you install the upper, it's way too tight and you cannot get them apart, so I had to dremel that down. <clears throat> I also had to dremel inside the hop-up unit because the BBs would get stuck inside the hop-up unit and like in the feed tube, and so you couldn't actually clear the chamber properly, which I honestly think is kind of dangerous. Right. Uh, what else was it? Oh, uh, my spring guide. That broke within a two within two weeks of me having that gearbox shell on an M160 63 RPS DSG setup. Uh, I had to like JB weld it back together. Uh, the oh my main complaint uh, I won't even call it my main complaint just another complaint is they have an anti reversal latch release on it but the window for it is above where it would normally be on a gearbox like normally whenever you have a gearbox with an anti reversal latch release you can take off the motor grip and then you have access to the anti reversal latch release. But for whatever reason, RetroArms put it above that portion. So in order to get to the entire reverse latch release, you actually have to take the lower portion of the gearbox out of the receiver. But for a split shell, that completely defeats the purpose of having an anti reverse latch release because you can't get to it without first releasing the piston. I, I found that so to be the biggest kind of just, thing that just frustrated me the most because most of the things that were yeah, it's, it's like most of the things that happened with the split shell, you could like modify to work. Like, the hop-up unit, we could modify to work. You know, the top of the shell, we could modify to fit us, you know, a charging handle. Those are just stupid things, but you can do it. You know, you can't really put in an anti-reversal latch release unless you, like, you know, destroy your motor grip to kind of put that little notch there. Yeah, and at the same time, it's just, like, a lot of the problems it has were, could have been so easily prevented, which is, I don't know, maybe more product testing, maybe some common sense, I don't know. Yeah. Um... But yeah, that's I think that's the thing that frustrated me the most was just the fact that like I'm paying $155 for a gearbox shell, like I shouldn't be having these small problems like this. Exactly. But, yeah. 
And also, as of late, the last two SHS pistons I tried wouldn't even fit on the piston rails properly. They were too tight, so I had to uh, dremel down the piston rails in order to get them to slide smooth. It's but, just, yeah. like, a lot of the things that happen with retro arms, uh, like products, is their uh, lack of interest in legitimate public feedback. Um, like, retro arms, if you don't know the listeners to this podcast, uh... Uh, sponsors airsoft tech and Q and A. Um, that's probably the largest concentration of you know quote unquote text and actual text, you know, on any social platform. So I you have separated text and actual text. <laughs> yes, because some people are like, like I will say, some people aren't text and they try to be text. Others are trying. They're 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 legitimately trying to learn and they're trying to search through, through the amount of information that's crap and the amount of information that's legitimate. So, I mean, yeah, there are some in there that just don't know what they're doing. But there are a lot in there that want to know what they're doing. So, um, Retro Arm sponsors are tough tech and Q&A. And like I said, this has the largest concentration of text on any social like media platform, I'd say. It certainly beats Airsoft Mechanics Forum. It beats um, uh, Airsoft Society, Airsoft Forum, Airsoft Sniper Forum, etc. There are just all these forums that are starting to die out because of this Facebook page. So well, I, would, I wouldn't say it beats them. I would say it has... A higher concentration of members. Yeah, that's what I that's what I mean yeah, by beats them. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean by beats them. Is it just out populates like them? The quality on airsoft mechanics, by the way, far blows out the quality of the like the Facebook page. Oh yeah, even certainly. If, even if eighty percent of the people on the Facebook page are also the people on airsoft mechanics, it's just like the the, the, the community over there is so concentrated and so different than the community on like Facebook, for example. Right, and what I'm like what I'm saying though is that there's a higher population. You know, oh, yeah, on airsoft oh, taking Q and A, and like when Retro Arms sponsored uh, airsoft taking Q and A, we we made a deal that uh, you know we wouldn't be biased in any of our reviews. We'd tell the you know outright, flat out truth about their products if they sucked. And this is like back when Retro Arms was kind of, or they're still a new company, but this is when they were a super new company. And so uh, you know they uh, don't like to test products, and that's just really unfortunate because they have access to so many good techs and uh, you know some of the world's best and they just don't give them products to test and sure a tech would love to get a product to test to keep but he would also want to give actual feedback on it so that he can buy this product and rely upon it to be a good product like if there's a hundred fifty five dollar shell out there that's really good and I, I it's basically guaranteed and it's been through so much testing that it's gonna be worth my money I'd buy it in a heartbeat but the only thing that's holding me back from buying the retro arm split shell right now is the fact that it honestly isn't worth the $155 price tag because it has so many little issues that could have been sorted out if they were just willing to send out beta models to actually test, get legitimate feedback, and then make corrections as needed. And that was my problem with uh, the retro arm shells, that so many things could have been corrected if they were just patient. Yeah, if I'm going to be a test dummy, I'd prefer not to pay to be a test dummy. Exactly. That, that, that's the big that's thing. They're selling a product that isn't truly finished. Yeah, that, that, that's kind of like a recurring theme with all their products, though, is that the first, they're, just to add on what you're saying, they, they like to rush the products out and get the ideas out there. They have a lot of good ideas. They're putting a lot of the work to good use, but they're not maximizing the ability of the products before they release it to the market. So one of the biggest examples is their triggers. When their triggers hit the market, they were not compatible with any contact set. Like, you had to modify every single contact set on the market to make them work. So how that passed inspection and how that got to the market, I have no idea because that means they, they either tested that, found that out, and didn't care and still put it on the market, or they tried to copy the dimensions of a trigger they had and didn't actually test their product if it, if it would even work before they put it on the market. So there's just little things like that that keep recurring with like their products. Um, their spring guides, for example, the the, the pr proprietary spring guides were press fitted together, and they would literally start falling apart after use and builds. Um, uh, I think Jacob said he had an M160 spring DSG build where his spring guide literally just it's like it fell apart. It was press fitted, yeah. and the the um, actual post of the spring guide came off the base. Uh, you said you JB you JB all of that back together, right? Yeah, I had to. And keep in mind, this is this is within two weeks of a build like this. Like, this is a shell that's supposed to be able to withstand like MS210 spring setups. You know, no problem. It, it just goes to show how like they didn't actually test it with, for example, 
a high stress setup. They just kind of put the parts together, made sure it worked, and then they were done with it. They didn't actually go through and do proper testing. Um, with, with the triggers, if they did any testing at all, they would have found out that there was a problem with them and they had to go back and redesign them. So uh, just with retro arms, they have a really common theme of rushing products out and the first generation of every product they make is really like what should be the beta run where the, the feedback they get from the community is more or less the beta test of the product and as they change and update the product, that's going to be the actual one that will stay on the market. And it's just sad when you get things like this split gearbox shell that are that they cost so much money, but they still do the same process where the entire first run of them on the market was uh, basically the same as their beta shell. So another story, one of our friends, Corey, who we had in the podcast previously, he was given the original beta shell for the version 2 splits by Re- Retro Arms to test and source any problems with the report back to them. And... After Corey had the shell, he tested it, he worked with it a bit, he reported his findings back to Retro Arms. Within, like, what, two days was it? They already had the entire first production run made and shipped out to, to retailers, which means that, like, there's, it's physically impossible for them to have taken all that information Corey gave them, changed the shells and edited the shells, and then started making them as they should have been. It means that they knew they had a beta product out to Corey, they knew they were waiting for feedback from Corey to see how they could make their product better, but they still decided to make the first production run while that beta product was out because they were trying to rush the product out the door and start selling it as quick as possible, which in, in one sense it's good. They're trying to get the product to the community, but in the grand scheme of things, it's really not that good because it means that they're going to keep putting out subpar quality parts and subpar designs as the generation one of everything they push out. And that's one of the things I was talking to their to our to representatives about is that I'm hoping to help them with that right now where they're sending me a shell. It's already sent. I just haven't received it yet. Um, so that I can test it myself and I can take all the measurements and I can compare it to other shells and I can test fit them with parts and I can report back directly to their design team to tell them what's wrong with it, which areas are made off spec basically and what they have to change to make it work right. But this is something they should have done originally before they even set the shell out. It, it took them a whole production run of failed shells to then contact me and ask me to fix it for them, which like it really shouldn't have happened that way. It should have happened beforehand when they gave it to Corey, who's just as qualified, if not more qualified than I am to do the tests. And they didn't even listen to his feedback before trying to rush the product out. So that's my little rant on it, I guess. Like, uh, so many things with retro arms are so poorly designed. Like, you were talking about the spring guide and uh, how Jacob's broke. The way it broke, like, we were looking at it, and the way it broke, it actually, it didn't actually, like, separate from the press fitting. It just snapped. And and, uh, it snapped where, because, like, the way that spring guide works is the threads don't go all the way through the spring guide. They only go through, like, the first little bits of it, like, where the uh, legs... It's only about a centimeter of threads. Yeah, basically only a centimeter of threads where the pegs hold it kind of in the gearbox shell. And so the rest of that spring guide is mounted there, and when you have all that pressure on that one point, you know it's gonna snap somewhere because you don't you don't have it secured very well, and it's all towards the rear. So it snapped, you know, right there. And uh, so we JB bought it back and put it into a vise and just left it like that overnight and ran it out. Has it had any more issues yet, Jacob? So far, so good. I think actually no. I heard a rattling sound last time that uh, piston stripped. I actually need to open it up and double check, but I'm pretty sure it's good. Alrighty. After we JB welded it. Well, um, Find it's out just, eventually, like, man. that's such a yeah. dumb thing that you'd have to do because it doesn't accept other spring guides, like accept their yeah. spring guides. And now, I actually had to uh, yeah. whenever I whenever I got that shell, uh, since the threads since they're so so shallow, I had to uh, cut down my buffer tube screw because it was too long. And keep in mind that's like the short kind of GMP buffer tube screw, so it's already a short screw. But I had to cut it. I had to cut about a centimeter or two off of it before it would even go in there properly. That, that's something good to know because I'm probably going to have to do that too, thinking about it. Yeah. I have the same receiver. Right. Um, like, but another faulty problem uh, that they have with their parts, like they're, uh, I ordered one of their RetroArms Palm Piston Head, P-O-M, however you say it, one of their piston heads recently, and it didn't even make it into a build because yeah. I put it on the piston for the build. Yeah, he knows. <laughs> I put it onto the piston for the build, and immediately, like, just getting it, like, hand tight, I'm tightening the screw onto the piston head inside the piston, and the thread stripped out. 
And I'm like, huh, that's weird. Okay, I'll grab another screw that's longer so I can reach all the way in it. Grab another screw that's longer. The screw goes completely through the front of it. So I'm like, okay, what the heck? You know, I take it all out. And all of the threads are plastic. And the wall between the front of the piston head and the actual inside threading is <coughs> extremely, extremely thin. So that's how that screw went through it. So basically I was completely out of a piston head and it never even made it into a build. And they never offered to like give me anyone or anything. And you were set so back I'm 20 bucks. That. Yeah. Now, on the flip side though, they are doing things to make small changes. Like they have already fixed the spring guide flaws, right? They put out a new generation spring guide with a lot longer threads, I think. They, they said, said that, but I have not seen one yet. I mean, honestly, they said that, you know, right after they let out the new split shell, or not new, yeah. but they let out this, the production run of split shells, so I was assuming I would get one of those. Like, even yeah. uh, one person I know, Lori Maki, he even said, you know, oh, I'm surprised you no. didn't get one. Did apparently he had one. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I, I yeah. think he's the one that told me about, like, they like, confirmed to me that he um, had a different design on his yeah. spring guide. Yeah, he had a split shell that had the different kind of spring guide, so I don't, I'm not entirely sure how I got a, the exact same shell with a different spring guide. Which kind of goes to show the inconsistency there is, you know, staggering, because that shouldn't have happened at all. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I guess we'll find out next week when I get mine if it comes. Because apparently mine's supposed to be whatever they're they're currently making right now. They took it right off the production run, just sent it in a box and gave it to me. So it should be whatever they're currently giving, like Brill or clandestine or selling from their website. I'm surprised they're still making them. I, well, because I know that they were setting up a second CNC machine, a second whole kind of production system. That's why they were out of stock for like an abnormally long time with all their products they weren't making them but now they have a second one they started making everything again so i think they, they're like in the process of restocking everything so they just took it off the production line and sent it to me well if they're specifically uh, sending you one for testing i'm assuming you're going to get whatever the new good spring guide is well yeah I, I'm, I'm assuming too but i guess it'll it'll debunk any rumors if there like really wasn't the new spring guide for example like like if i were to get the one you received that would kind of prove that there isn't a new one yet because, well, I believe there's a new I, I one because the brand newest, um, brand newest. Well, I am getting the newest generation of whatever they're putting out to the market right now. Yeah. So, um, so I think we've talked about the retro arm split show pretty well, but uh, we can we can re just review our like a basic, uh, you know, take on it real quick. While I was at Jacob's house, we wrote down a list of pros and cons. Yes, there are pros to it, but you know the cons are just there and they're so blatant that they'd almost make the shell not worth it they don't make it worth it in my it, the shell isn't worth it in my opinion to some people oh, it might be if i had known all this before i had bought it i would not have bought it right exactly and uh, some of the people would be like okay well i'll just modify this this and that and i've got a shell that'll never break you know that's a mindset i guess you could say but the pros that we came up with are it's split that's obviously a huge you know uh, time saver because when something would break down and Jacob would like work on the lower, he'd, he'd toss me the upper and I'd work on it and like perfect air seal and get the type of plate timing right. And it, we were like really fast on that. So that, that was awesome. It's easy to work on kind of referring to it being, it being split. It's tough because it's, you know, well, the, the material it's made out of 7075 aluminum CNC. Of course it's going to be tough. Uh, it's pre radius, which is, you know, always a plus and it's pre radius correctly. So that's a uh, big thing there. The ARL release is cool, but there's no point in where it's located, so that's a negative to it. Um, the ARL well, design it's is really cool. It's like a pointless addition. Huh? Like, 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 it might as well not be there, I guess. Like, the, yeah. the thing with it, though, is that if you took the motor grip off, then you could do it. But why do you need to take the motor grip off? So, like, well, that's kind of the stupid thing. The reason thing. you need, like, honestly, in all split shells, you really do need an anti-reversal latch release. Right. Because if you just pop it off without first releasing the latch, then you're going to do damage to your piston. Exactly. So, because the teeth are just going to slip off of it. The ARL design, though, is really cool, I think. The way it, I actually the, like the ARL design. Yeah. It I'm, can, not, I'm not normally, like, an advocate of proprietary parts, but, like, I don't see how that one would have any problem i mean you know god forbid i speak too soon but yeah i don't, I don't see how it would have a problem the way they made it yeah. it's just kind of screwed into the shell which i really like because it honestly just sits there like you do not have it's like another part you just don't have to worry about exactly it was a good improvement i thought as long as it's reliable as long as it doesn't break because once you have to replace it if it's a proprietor that's when you get like annoying headaches now like the spring they included the anti-reversal latch spring that broke but that's the normal strange. one worked so i just went ahead and replaced it 
Oh yeah, I remember that. You were like, oh crap, because you didn't know if it'd work or not. I was like, go figure. But, but uh, yeah, like the tiny spring. But no, I actually like the anti rupture latch. The last pro we have is that it has a quick change spring. I also uh, like how they did their wire guide. But yeah, yeah. So they got that quick change spring system and the wire guide channels are pretty cool. I forgot about that one. The way the wire yeah, channels work. I just work, like it, how they had the uh, overhanging piece that kind of like covers over the wires. Right, so you can't break anything by installing a motor and running it. But uh, now on to the cons, because there are quite a few, but uh, we've already discussed them, so it's kind of like branch over them. Uh, too much anodization. Uh, it's just, it makes everything now, so actually, tight. Actually, I'm going to comment on that, because um, I was talking to Tom, and from what he told me, now, I know... As far as, I, as far as I know about the company, he, he's not part of the team that designs or makes them. He's kind of like the representative, more or less. But from what he told me is that after the anodizing process is finished, net material is actually taken away, not added to the shell. See, the well, thing I call out on I that. comment on that. Um, see, like, I've, I've had the chance. I've worked on uh, Corey Eskew's beta split shell, which yeah. one of the main differences between his and mine is that his isn't anodized, mine is. And... He didn't have those fitment problems that I had where, like, stuff was too thick. Like, for example, that rear portion that fits into where the rear body pin goes, how that was too tight in the lower yeah. gearbox shell. Which yeah, you'd think would know, be, like, one of the things that would definitely work in a split shell. But he didn't Tom have that problem. Told that that the, uh, Tom told me the beta tester before Corey, because you know how that shell got passed around a lot? Not yeah. a lot, maybe, like, it was, I think, two Twice. or three people. But the, um, the beta tester before Corey told Retro Arms to actually widen some areas, including piston rails, to get a tighter fit for pistons and things like that. So that's just something that they listened to him and they did, and then sent out the production, and they didn't really get feedback from Corey or the other beta tester first. They just kind of, because that was the, because that was the feedback they got, like, with time still to spare before they sent the um, first generation boxes out. But then they just had that same beta shell be passed around from user to user. So by the time I finally got to Corey, for example, they were already kind of decided that they were sending the shells out. And they already started making them before he was able to give his feedback. But two other people had already given their feedback. So again, according to what Tom told me, is that the original beta tester told them to um, widen some areas. So whether they actually did widen some areas, and that's the reason why it's having fitment issues, or if it's just anodizing, I don't know. But from what the information... And Tom's given me, it's that the anodizing itself isn't what's causing it. It's the fact that they just literally made the areas and that like the, those spaces of the shell too wide. Like the design is flawed. Assuming well, that's either way, it's they uh like by the time you know Corey got the shell, he was reviewing a completely different product because they had yeah. already changed around so many things. Like it, there was no point in him even having a beta test shell because it wasn't the same product. Like they should have sent him one of the newer run ones. But to my knowledge, I don't even think they tested, you know, the new ones after they had made them. Because, like, if, oh, no, if you know, somebody tells me to widen them and then I get my shell and it doesn't even fit together, like, that's the only thing I'm led to believe. Uh, yeah, exactly. That, that fits up with the story I was told, too, where they, they gave, basically they gave the beta shell to someone, took his feedback, and then they started making changes to the beta shell. And the beta shell kept getting passed around. But they were already like in the process of making changes and making the first production run. So by the time it got to Corey, his feedback didn't really even matter anymore because they'd already made some changes. So he was testing a shell that wasn't matching what they had in the um, factory. And then we also learned later that they had sent out the first generation of gearboxes to retailers like just two days after that Corey sent his review. And so like. Even if they did listen to his review, they didn't have nearly any enough time to implement any changes that he set into it. So I think that they definitely did do changes to the shell based on the beta testers. They just didn't give the beta testers enough time to implement as many changes as they possibly could have to fix it. And then I, I do also agree with what you said. They probably just made those changes in-house and then just sent them out. They didn't retest the shell with the changes. Because I think that's one of the reasons why they contacted me is I'm supposed to be testing that shell now that they made changes to because there were so many problems with it because they didn't double check anything. See, assu if, assuming that uh, what Tom said is like true, that the anodization does take away a part of the shell's surface, widening those channels, like the piston channels, like and making the uh, like the certain the area where the split shell fits in, like it, it the pin in the back goes into the split shell to secure it to the lower. 
Like, that doesn't make any sense. You really wouldn't even need to do that because it's already secured in the upper. Like, that's how ICS uh, Split Shell did it. And I know ICS Split Shell is, like, kind of something that not very many people like, but it works much better than the Retro Arms one. So I don't know why they'd uh, do that or even take that advice. I'm not, not sure where that comes into. And, like, also, um, they had, like, these weird two ridges inside the hop-up unit where it basically would hold the BB or prevent the BB from going through. So we actually had to take a Dremel and, like, carve those out. Oh, and yeah, it, I forgot it, about that. It was to the point to where yeah, it was dangerous, those are actually. straight-up design flaws that, like, if they had sent that through testing, like, that version went through testing, that would have been found, and they obviously probably just didn't. The problem with that, like, is that, like, that hop-up mount, like, the defect, is that that's actually incredibly dangerous, because we, we put a mag through it, and we tested, we tried to get it through the chrono, and it would, like, you know, feed, jam, feed, skip, you know, that kind of thing. And so um, we took the mag out, and then we split the upper, and, like, he handed me the upper, and I was looking at it, and there was a BB still in the hop-up chamber because it got pushed through those ridges, barely, but it was locked in there now. So your gun could fire. You know, if you, if you like, were in a game, and you took your mag out and fired a couple rounds, and that BB was in there but it didn't fire, you have a live gun now. And you can show your friends and, like, hey, listen how cool my gun is, and then fire it, and then the BB's going to rock it out. So, I mean, that's, a, yeah, that's, a, that's such a bad design flaw because it's actually very dangerous. That was part of the problem we were having is like whenever it was the BBs were still getting stuck in it, we had we could only clear the gun by holding it upside down. Yeah, and it was just that was one thing that just was so ridiculous. So I'm not sure why that you know change was implemented. I guess uh, the anodization can, we can check off, but we can't. We do know if we check that off, we do know that the shell was made thicker in certain areas. So yeah, it was made thicker, yeah. and they didn't test it after they made it thicker. Right, and which yeah, just creates a whole new host of problems. So. What they should have done was they sent the beta shell out, they took all the info from the beta testers, and they changed the shell design, and they re-CNC'd the shells, and they started shipping those out. What they should have done was retested the shells after they changed them, because they basically took ideas from people. So, like, the tester would say, make this area wider, make this area thinner, and then they would make it wider and thinner by their own specs and not retest those new specs now. They just sent it out. And now they're having me retest those specs finally, like, what, a month later after they've already sold a billion of them and people have had all these complaints with them. What they should have done is had someone test it right away since they made a change to it and didn't confirm that it had worked properly. See, Not waited until the first production line failed, and now they're recontacting more people to, to check what the flaws are. See, it's good to assume positive things about a company, but there is really no positive thing to assume here. Either A, Retro Arms was too lazy after they got some feedback on the shell and, you know, changed some stuff without testing it and then sent them out, or they were, you know, stupid and they took the guy's suggestions, you know, the guy who they gave the first beta model to, and then uh, modified certain things in the shell to, you know, to what he said, and then but tested it. Show. But see, if they tested it and noticed problems and shipped it out anyway, they're doing bad either way. So either A or B, they did something really wrong here, and it's just hard to assume which is more positive. So, because you can't here. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and that's part in of the, the grand scheme of things. Me. Yeah, like, uh, sorry, in, in like in the grand scheme of things, they are getting around to solving the issue. Like, they have contacted me. I'm sure they've contacted other people too. And they are resending these shells back out to be fixed. However, like, they should have done this as part of the testing process before they even sold the shell. Because basically what it comes down to is they put a product on the market where the final version that they put on the market, they still hadn't tested that yet. Or if they had, te like Ryan was saying, if they had tested it, they ignored all the obvious flaws that were right there because they just wanted to push it on the market and they wanted to get it out there and they wanted to start selling them. So... I'm going to assume it was the former, not the latter, that they basically, they had a beta, they sent the beta out, that they got feedback, they implemented changes based on the feedback, but then just didn't retest the new shell, and they just kind of assumed it would work and sent it out. Now, obviously the flaw there is that they didn't retest. You should all, whenever you make change to anything, you should retest it, because you, you need to make sure it will work. If, if you change a variable in anything, whether it's like, code for a computer or a program or it's a gearbox shell or it's a piston or it, even not airsoft stuff if you're if you're building something and you change some of the specs you have to retest it to make sure the new product 
works properly for the application. And right. they just didn't do that. They assumed it would work. And because they assumed, all these problems are coming out from the community who spent the money on the product and spent the money on the shell rather than the tester who's reporting back to the company. So now, all this time later, they're resending it to testers. Um, and I will be able to get the shell. I will be able to report back on the flaws and tell them what to change and how to fix it. But like, what it comes down to is like they should have done this before putting the shell on the market. Like, yeah, like, at, at least they too. are trying to fix it, but like they should have done it before. Sorry, Jacob. No, you're good. That's part of the reason it kills me is that like whenever they first before these shells even came out, uh, Retro Arms had actually told me that I would be getting a shell. Same with uh, other Ryan number one. Uh, they told him that he would be getting a shell too. And, you know, they only ended up sending a beta test shell to Corey. And that's part of the reason it kills me is because, like, if I had gotten that beta test shell, I wouldn't be having all these problems I'm having with mine now, currently. Right. Well, no, I'll take that back, because even if I had gotten the beta test shell, they would have already sent those out. Well, assuming they would have handled an actual beta run properly, there wouldn't be any problems. So, like, we're trying to assume what they could do to do best, yet they did probably the worst thing that they could do in this situation. So, but, uh, yeah... I forget where we're at in the cons, but uh, basically um, we can kind of check too much anodization off that list because if what Thomas is saying is accurate, which you know we're gonna, I'm gonna assume it is, um, because it's coming right from the guy who made it. Uh, we can assume that he made changes to the shell, yet they didn't test it to actually see if those changes were going to, you know, be beneficial or negative. And so, as you can tell, we had a, quite a bit of a negative experience with it. But uh, the last couple cons, like the AR- the ARL release positioning is poor. You can't disengage before splitting the shell, which, as Jacob said earlier, is a massive problem because it can lead to premature piston wear. If you like take a shell and you split it in half before, like when the piston is in half cycle, you're basically just allowing that sector gear to just molest the, the teeth because it just has to run across it. So that's a really really bad uh, part of that shell. It's just kind of stupid. And then uh, most charging handles don't work with it. I think. GMP work, right? Uh, yeah, GMP charging handles uh, work. Okay, GMP charging handles work without modification. Um, now, you have to modify will, the shell. I will give them credit here. They did say that the split gearbox was made to fit GMP receivers, and that is the only receiver they confirmed it would fit in. So the fact it's that it's the GMP only one they tested charging it in. handles exactly. So like that's what it comes down to. But like. This wasn't a fact hidden in the dark. Like they, they were open initially, telling people that like we only tested it in GMP receivers. It was made to fit GMP receivers, and that's one of the reasons why Corey was testing it in the VFC receiver and made that initial video because he was saying like, yes, it was made for GMP, but you can also use it in VFC. Like that was the whole point of that video. Um, so, and what what it comes down to is GMP charging handles are actually thinner than most other brands. So because they made it to GMP spec, you end up getting proprietary issues like this where charging handles won't fit unless they're made to the GMP spec. I think someone said King Arm charging handles fit fine too. But see, like the, uh, the, I can't confirm. I forget where I heard that from though. So, somebody said some other brand fits. It might have been King Arm. Yeah. yeah. But like the fact that most char- charging handles don't fit, you know, minus GMP, really aggravates me because that just limits like what I can do with the show. That basically is telling me I need to have a GMP. Res- like I'm not do uh, like. I'm curious, Does do you have to have both the GMP upper and the charging handle to work with the split show, or do you just need the charging handle? Because, like, if it's just the charging handle, I'm pretty fine with that, but if it's both uh, the upper Corey and the charging handle... I used a VFC upper with a GMP charging handle, and it worked. Okay, cool. That yes. That's much better, then. But uh, uh, I will be testing mine in a full-on GMP receiver set. However, I don't have a GMP charging handle, so that'll be interesting to see how I shave it down to fit. When you get the shell, take, compare the uh, top ridge of it to another shell and just see how much taller yeah, it is. Yeah. It's just that part is the most pointless part, I think, because I it's just taller. I plan on comparing it directly to a um, Gen 2 Lonex shell. That'll be a good test. Like, throughout, throughout every single test, and then I might pull out some old like ch- Chinese... Um, ACM shells because I can, but like I- I'm gonna compare every single dimension of the RA shell to a Lonex shell on a Lonex hop up just to get a baseline because I know the Lonex is compatible and I, I know what um, issues it has and doesn't have, so it'll be a good baseline. All right, but uh, and then the last con we have is that it's inconsistent with there's a lot of things that it does. It's just like 
piston rails being too tight or like inconsistency between batches because some people have not reported a problem with them other people have reported massive problems with them so it's kind of weird but uh, yeah that, that is the thing i'm still caught on is that like for example half the problems you and jacob had i think you were either like the only one or one of maybe two accounts i've heard of like that specific problem happening so the fact that it's inconsistent is what's concerning me a little bit as well um, because I don't know what's going on with the quality control process then there. Well, part of my like, thing example, is that also, your, I mean, your I'm not going to speak for, like, the whole of the community that bought them. Mm. Sorry, say that again? Yeah. Oh, no, no, I was just saying, like, um, go on, basically. <laughs> oh, yeah. Me. Anyway, <laughs> I didn't lose my train of thought. Sorry, Jacob. I'm sorry. You were talking about um, you don't want to speak for the whole community, but oh, okay. Yeah, it's like I don't want to speak for the whole community that bought these shells, but like, yeah, I tend to do you know higher stress builds than I would say most people. I think that's safe to say. And oh, yeah, so you ran a 14.8 in that thing. <laughs> I you think just... that's part of the reason why I may have had more problems with it is just because like I'm I'm trying more parts. I'm you know you, I'm having a lot more variation in my build a lot higher stress so that may be part of the reason why i've found some of these problems but other stuff you know such as pistons not fitting the uh the shell the two halves of the shell being too tight together like the arl release like come on like that could be with anybody yeah right but uh i'm pretty sure that wraps up our retro arm split shell talk um and we will be able to revisit this by the way because um hopefully next week i will have received mine and then i will be able to let you know what changes they've made. I, I can basically compare my experience to Jacob's and say if they've made any changes since he's received his or not. And then if they have or haven't, I can still report on what I've found, uh, hopefully. And then we're trying to get Ryan one too. So we're, we're hoping that we can have like a multiple kind of ways of experience to keep talking about this yeah. as they progress. I just need to ask. I'm just going to ask for and be like, hey, send me a split shuttle review. <laughs> Honestly, you might. I mean, that's what I did, and they're like, "Yep, we'll give you one." <laughs> so, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to Tom probably tomorrow. But um, yeah, that pretty much wraps up our uh, review on it. I'm excited to see what Ryan gets because I'm just, I don't know what I'm gonna do if he gets the show and there's absolutely no problems with it whatsoever. Honestly, I would be so. <laughs> I'll do. I'll be mad. <laughs> I'd be very mad. <laughs> I, I I would kind of be mad too because like. I, I know they haven't changed anything in the design because that's why they contacted me and that's why I was just talking to Tom about like the products in general, not even the split shell. And then he brought up giving me one to test to really like fix all the issues with it. So like, like the way he worded it, like I, I know they haven't changed anything yet. So if I get one and let's say I only have like two of the issues that you guys experience, like that's going to go straight down to quality control then. And like, that's a whole other issue that we haven't even really factored in here yet because it's, it's a, such a new company. This is like the first production line of the product, so we don't really have anything to compare it against to like say if it's quality control or not. But I'm really hoping it's not because that's a whole other issue in itself where no matter how good your design is, if you can't consistently make these shells, you're always going to have problems. Right, right. So um, I'm very interested to see what Ryan gets into, and I hope the viewers are as well. And... Uh, Hopefully, it won't be a frustrating experience for Ryan, but at the same time, like, he was meant to test it, so we'll see. But uh, that brings us into our discussion slash short debate. And today we're talking about 22 TPA motors versus 32 TPA motors, because some people tend to say that, you know, the highest you really need to go is 22 TPA, because, you know, whether you spam semi-auto a lot or not, both motors will warm up eventually. And so, you know, 32 TPA is technically more efficient and it pulls less amps, but is that efficiency, you know, really worth it? Do you really need that efficiency compared to a 22 TPA? So, um, I'll but start... Huh? But that Frank and Torque, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. See, I'll start off by saying I actually like 32 TPAs a lot more than 22 TPAs. Like, a, a good 22 TPA is awesome, but I just love the fast trigger response from a 32 and the uh, efficiency from it, like even though it is negligible, not negligible, but you know, not a huge gain, it's still there, and that's why I like it. So, kind of like my early take on, it, I guess you could say. And uh, I got some ASG 28 TPA motors to review. So, you know, I'm a fan for you know high TPA. So I'm, I can't wait to test those out. But uh, that's a little besides the point. 
but still, I just, you know, 28, 32 TPAs are really cool, in my opinion. I don't know why. I like them. Torque, efficiency, it's all cool. So I do like them more than 20, 22 TPA, but 22 TPA does have its, you know, fit. It's just like, you know, its own fit. So you, that's why I don't think it's, like, better than a 32, because it just, in my opinion, or, like, what I, what I prefer in my builds, it's not. So, kind of my take. I think 22 is, like, the in-between. Because if you think about it, you know, the three the three main TPAs that you normally hear being used are 16, 22, and then 32. Right. So I would, I would consider 22 the, uh, the in-between there. See, like, how I consider to a motors, like, I, I think anything below 16, like, 16 and below is, uh, not 16 and below, uh, 14 and below is speed. 16 is balance. Um, 16 to 18 is balance. 22 to like 24 is torque, and then beyond that, you're looking at like your Franken torques, your massive torque. You know, that that's how I classify motors. Yeah, that, that, that's a pretty good. I would agree with that. Because like 22 TPA is pretty darn torquey. Sure, 16 TPA is as well, but you know, 22 TPA can pull like anything. So it's pretty much the torque motor. But uh, 32 TPA can pull anything without a sweat at all. So that's kind of the point there. I suppose my argument is a little bit biased. Like I'm, I'm thinking ten to one whenever I'm talking about this, and I don't know why. Well, because it's just the the speed plus you know the massive amount of torque it results in so much efficiency. Yeah. So yeah, I guess yeah, I'll chime in. I because I do own motors with 14, 16, 22, 28, and 32 TPA, and I use them all. Um, uh, to be completely honest, it depends on the bill until. And this is, I guess, what we're debating on, is that, in my opinion, until you get past 22 TPA, it just depends on the build. Um, whether you need a Lonex A1 at 14 TPA, whether you need an SHS High Torque or ZCI Balance at 16, a JG Red, which is 16 to 18, I think it's 16 TPA, but it performs like an 18 TPA. Um, I'll figure that out later. I have one upstairs. I just need to open it up. Um... JG Blue, the notorious JG Blue, that the uh, 22 TPA, um, the and then you go higher than that. You have the A and K High Torques, the SEMA High Torques. Now the a a ASG Green Motors at 28 TPA. Your Franken Torques with the Chowley Arms uh, with uh, 32 TPA. It just when I've used them, so I've gotten the most use out of the 14 to 22 range, and those are the motors that I will use in customer guns. Those are the motors that I will go to for my personal guns. Those are the motors that I will be able to give you a build list, like, off the top of my head. Like, if you tell me to meet this criteria, you give me a set of um, variables you want your gun to basically end up with. Um, and I, I'm, I'm telling you a build list to meet that criteria. I will use a motor between 14 and 22 TPA. That's where my comfort zone is. That's what I like to use. That's what I find the easiest and most common to use. Um, partly because they're the easiest to buy. Like until this um, ASG Green Motors came out, you really only could buy 28 TPA motors from like two websites, and you had to buy them through A and K. And the TPA wasn't listed. You just kind of had to know they were 28, or you had to get them through your stock guns. Like you had to open up an A and K and find the motor, or open up a SEMA and find the motor. Um, and then 32, you couldn't purchase it. You have to make that yourself. You have to find an old Charlie arm, a neodymium can, and throw something together. So just the availability is, I think, one aspect of it that gives you to that 14 to 22 range that like, gives it the advantage. But, like, I also am partial to speed when I build my guns. I, I like high rate of fire. Normally, when I'm accepting big jobs, when I actually, like, will, like I, I agree to a big job, it's for a speed build. So I don't find myself using 28 and 32 TPA motors that often. Um, now, with that being said, I actually have a 28 TPA in my DSG right now, so I'm being a little bit of a hypocrite. But I, I, I do think they have a purpose because my 28 TPA does definitely run more efficiently than my 22 TPA in my 10 to 1 DSG setup. However, they both run efficiently enough, and the 22 TPA does give me the same trigger response at a higher rate of fire, but it does also run hotter. I think that's kind of, in, that's comparing it to a 28, but I think comparing it to a 32 would probably be basically the same comparison. 
Um, the 28 to 32s, they definitely have their purpose. But for most builds, I don't really see a point in having that much torque. That's probably where I'm going to end that yeah. one. See, I like uh, one of the reasons. Also, one of the reasons why I like super high TPA motors is because they almost always stop on the same position. Like if you have a if you have a good consistent mm -hmm. cutoff lever setup, you know they always like, stop really consistently. Open. Yeah, that's true too. Like like they definitely have their purpose and they are more efficient if nothing else. However, I well, like I said, I, I'm partial to speed builds, so the rate of fire drop for the tiny increase in trigger response that I don't even know is past 22 and so like really it's gauging the rate of fire drop versus the cooler performance and I, I will almost always use 22 and I won't, won't go above 22 but every once in a while if I need that extra efficiency I'll throw in a 28 or a 32 and when I get up there it's really like it's, it's literally 28 or 32 I like classify them as the same type of motor because it, it gets to a point where you have so much torque it's it, the, the difference between those two motors is not even noticeable in most cases. Um, well, I'm going to disagree on that point just for, like, to give an example of one of my own builds. I have a, a, a GMP Voltor Defender that I made. It's a, a 10 to 1 single sector setup, Spectre. It's got a 32 TPA motor that I built. Uh, and part of the reason behind me using 32 TPA is because this isn't a build that I built for, you know, speed or anything. Like, I built this gun to literally only use semi. Like, I've never even used yeah. full... I'm not even sure if full auto on it feeds, to be honest, and I've never bothered to fix it, even if it doesn't, because I don't use it. Um, it's basically just a gun I built to be semi-only, so 32 is good in that case, because it stays cool. Like, that gun literally never heats up. Like, it's it's amazing. And then, you know, even if the trigger response compared to, like, a 22 TPA is negligible, I still know that's the better trigger response, even if only yeah. by a hair. Whether or not I can feel the difference is still irrelevant. Better. Because I mainly did it for the whole, the cool factor, you know? How, how cool it stays. Uh -huh. And, I mean, I guess because it's more electrically efficient, but I honestly don't care about that. <laughs> yeah. I'm lazy. It's, it's just how I am. Yeah, because it is, like... I guess for performance standards, like if I if I'm using a 28 or a 32 TPA motor to build, 99% of the time it's not for trigger response. At the, like it is, but like if I was choosing between, for example, a 32 TPA Franken Torque that I have or a JG Blue that I have, if I'm choosing the 32 TPA Franken Torque, it's because in that specific build. I want it to run as efficiently as possible, and I don't want the motor to heat up, and I don't want it to wear down quickly. Um, exactly. If I was running it for like trigger response, I would still put either of those two motors in because they're both going to give almost identical performance. The 32 TPA will have better response 99% of the time, but it, it's so close at that point where um, the, the real determining factor is that the 32 TPA is more efficient. And then basically, Wayne, do I want more rate of fire or do I want more efficiency? And that's kind of how I choose. Yeah, like, like one thing I recently did in my uh, my 10 to 1 DSG, like normally in the past 10 to 1 DSG builds I've done is I'll use a 22 TPA motor and 11 1 and 10 to 1s and I usually yield about 55 to 60 rounds per second. That's usually yeah. my go-to. Yeah, yeah, but as of recently, uh, and I honestly partially did this because I was being lazy again, but... I just kind of wanted, you know, another factor that I didn't have to worry about because I'd been, I'd killed like three motors in that gun for whatever freak reason. <laughs> and uh, so I just went ahead and I built a 32 and I put it in there and I ran it on a 14.8 to get similar rate of fire. So that was yielding about 63. And I mean, I honestly think that works. I mean, it honestly works better than the 11.1 because it was a little bit faster, but it still is more efficient than the 22 running on 11.1. That, that's true too. And that's something that I have to look more into is, so... I have a 14.8 LiPo, but I don't use it that often at all. And one of the things that I've been trying to tell myself is combining that higher torque motor with the 14.8 volt and seeing if it's still more efficient, if it still wears down slower than like an 11.1 on a lower TPA motor. Because obviously a, a torquier motor is going to be able to take more load, it's going to be able to run cooler, it's going to be able to drive through more powerful setups, but is the strain from the higher voltage going to wear it down prematurely? Like, that's something I've been meaning to look into is if the um, higher TPA and higher voltage combined 
like in the end is better than the lower TPA and lower voltage. From my understanding with motors, what you're looking at there, like if you have a 10 to 1 JG Blue setup, you're going to get around 60 RPS. If you have a 14.8 uh, 10 to 1 32 TPA setup, you're looking at around like 60 RPS. So, but you're getting about you're getting about the same RPS. One's just going to be you know cycling technically quicker because the motor is past its like you know it's on a 14.8 and the other one's on 11 1 volt. So you have one uh, cycling on a 14.8 and one cycling on 11 1 volt 8 11.1 geez and um, you're getting the same RPS. Uh, the 32 is going to heat up a little bit more I'd say I'd, I'd say than the uh, 22 simply because it's 14.8 and you're just dumping a lot of power into that motor. But um, it's still going to be able to handle it pretty well at the same time. Like it's not going to melt and die but at the same time it's going to get a little warm i mean that's a given you're running a 14.8 so um yeah in all honesty the setup i'm running uh, like compared to a uh, 10 to 1 22 tp on 11 1 on my 10 to 1 32 tp on a 14.8 i honestly think like as far as it heating up goes that it was about it took about the same amount of time i mean you gotta understand like i was blasting that thing you I really mean, were it, it, took, it, it did take a little while for it to heat up but at the same time like it does heat up a lot quicker on that 14A, and that's also because that setup draws a lot more, you know, amps. But I, I think the, uh, it's pretty similar. Mm. In my um, most recent build that I'll end up testing the RA shell in, I'm actually going to end up going the opposite. So I'm going from a 10 to 1 28 TPA DSG to a 10 to 1 16 TPA. Oh boy. Because um, I'm just, I I know I I'm, I'm curious as to what the RPS output would be still on 11 one uh, You're looking at basically a miniature sun. Something. I've done it before. My 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 estimation was around 65 to 68. Uh, I'm not looking to get 70, so if I end up getting higher than that, I'll just, I'll take it off and I'll redo it. But I, I'm doing this on a JG Red too, which it's technically it's 16 TPA as far as I've been able to confirm, but it performs with like an 18 TPA. So I'm wondering if, it, if that'll bring it down a little bit. But um, basically, my goal was to try the 28 TPA motor on a 14.8 volt and then compare that to the 16 TPA motor on a 11.1 volt because my, my guesstimate is that those two setups should give me roughly the same RPS value. So I basically wanted to go through and see which one's more efficient, which one's heating up quicker, et cetera, et cetera. And that was going to be my like little test thing. Um, but I'm leaning more towards using the JG Red motor in my 10 to 1 setup unless it becomes extremely hot when I'm using it, simply because I, I like to stay down on that 11.1 volt. I don't like to use the 14.8 volt if I don't have to. Right. I mean, your 16 TPA motor is going to heat up pretty quick on a setup like that. Yeah, no, it, it definitely will. I mean, you're, it's going to get really hot. But, I'm just uh, wondering how quick it is, basically. Um, Depending on, like, your... I mean, a couple rounds of semi aren't gonna make it hot, obviously, but like a mag dump is just gonna set it on. Like, it's not gonna be set on fire, but it's gonna feel like it's on fire. <laughs> Probably. Can't wait. Because I built a uh, the fastest DSG I built was 63 rounds a second, and that was a 14.8 on 10 to 1 32 TPA, and that thing was just wicked fast. It got hot, but like I never felt like my motor was gonna die. But then again, I never pushed it to the point where it was gonna die. So, On a I mean, 16 TPA, yeah. it will die. It's just a question yeah. of when. It's just a question of uh, how it's like many I said, rounds. I, I've done a build like that before on 10 to 1, 16 TPA, 11 to 1. It, it was an extremely long time ago, and I didn't leave it that way for long. I think I, the only reason I did it was just so I would have a gun that day because I really wanted to use a DSG. But I don't quote me on it, but for some reason I'm wanting to say 71. But I could be wrong, wrong there. Because What's 16 TPA? That sounds a little high, but I mean, I, still, I haven't built that yet, so I can't really... Yeah, I'm not entirely sure. My numbers sure. are based off of my basically my, my numbers are based off of my guessing, so what? I can't really confirm or deny that until I actually test it. What 16 TPA were you using, Jacob? Uh, uh Lone X A2, but it was one of the uh the old ones. Okay, well that was good. The one that actually worked. Those were uh 15 TPA, I have one but of those. So like one TPA. Yeah, off, those are 15 yeah. TPA. Sure. But they yep. they, 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 they probably oh, well, yeah. Basically. There's been so much misinformation spread about the TPA Lone Xs, it's hard to keep up. That wouldn't surprise me, though. I need to just cut up one of the ones I have here. I have, like, four of them I just sitting on the floor. The last I've heard, the A1 is 14, the A2 is 15, and the A3 is 16. 
pretty much. The A3 underperforms. The A3 has always stumped me because it's supposed to be the speed motor and it's the highest torque. Well, it just underperforms. See, I, I've heard different stuff about it. It really does. Like, it, it really does. I, I've heard the A3 underperforms under all of them, even though it has, like, a really amazing specifications. Like, it's supposed to be 16 TPA. I think it was, like, 20, yeah. 23 gauge, what, 21, 23? I don't remember. 23. Uh, basically, basically, it was built to be a really nice motor, but it underperforms. Yep. While, that, like, the A1 and the A2 both perform question. better than it. So, yeah, I'm not entirely I actually have an A3 here, too. Not sure if it works or not. I mean, it's the A3 had really, really high expectations, and then it just didn't live up to them at all. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm interested to test that out because basically that gun wouldn't be used for full auto except for showing off. It would be a semi-auto only build. Um, however, I'm building another DSG. Like I already have technically two. I'm building a third. So I, I want one that's above the 60 RPS limit because, like, there's no point in having that many if you don't have one that you can just say, like, look, look at how fast this is going, I guess. But um, yeah. if I end up going the 14.8 and 28 TPA route, I'll end up, like, uh, that's fine. Like, I'm happy with that. I just, I'd rather not use the 14.8 if I don't have to because I will be semi-spamming all day long when I actually use that, and I'd rather just stick with the 11.1 for that. Yeah, I wouldn't use fourteen eight on a semi only build. Yeah, exactly. So that that's that's what I'm leaning away from. But I also want the RPS. So if I stick with the eleven one like I want to, I'm gonna end up using the JG Red, which is like a sixteen to eighteen TPA motor. And I just I'm basically praying that it doesn't heat up too much. Well you also should realistically think like, you know I mean, you you're not talking a whole lot of difference in RPS because you can get sixty RPS on a JG Blue 10 to 1 setup, where you can get 60 RPS on a 14, 8, 10 to 1, 32 TPA setup, or you can get 70 RPS, you know, I mean, like, you know, yeah. there's a point in which, like, there's a reason why I haven't built me, like, a 63 or, like, 70 RPS DSG for my own personal use, is because it's just simply, you know, really, really hard to make reliable, so, I mean, like, that, that's just something that I always take into consideration. He's just scared of the DSG. speed. What? Yeah. He's just scared of the speed. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm not scared of speed. I just don't like um the fact that like Bless. there is such little room for error. <laughs> that's what I don't like. No, that, that is true though, and that's one of the things that I have to say that the um, I guess it held me back until now to finally do this is that I had a setup that worked. Um, I have a 28 TPA 10 to 1 setup. The trigger response is amazing. It doesn't heat up. It, it's basically the perfect CQB gun that I want, so there was no reason to change it. But and now where I'm trying to make one DSG more oriented towards field, one more oriented towards um, CQB, I also want one to have that high RPS value. So it gives me something to kind of play around with and test. So it's like out of the safety zone where I, I'm changing my primary that I use for um, indoors whenever I play indoors. But, I mean, as long as the motor doesn't kill itself in the semi-auto, uh, it, it'll be exactly what I want. So, it's worth a try. i definitely say so. I just, I'm just really hoping that the motor decides to stay with me on this one. Um, so, moving away from the motors, last topic, because we are pretty far into this podcast already, like we always do. But, but um... The question and answers that we get from the community. Um, do you guys have one off the top of your head right now, or are you still thinking of one? I, I have one. All right, you can start then, Ryan. All right. Um, I have I got a I got a question recently that I, I I honestly never thought I'd get, or you know wouldn't think I'd get for a very long time because I'm new at it. And uh, that question was how do I start um, a YouTube channel just for airsoft like. You know, solely for airsoft, airsoft gameplay, airsoft reviews, etc. And uh, I thought about it for a while, and I didn't actually, I don't think I've responded yet, because I, that kind of stumped me. I normally get questions like technical stuff, like, hey, how do I build this? What do I do for this? Or, why is my gun not cycling in semi? You know, stuff like that. And uh, this question kind of threw me off, and so I thought it was cool. Um, I'll, I'll tell everybody right now, I'm not YouTube famous. I'm not that popular. I have like 2,400 subs. But I would consider myself, you know, better off than some other airsoft YouTube channels simply because, and this is one of the things you're going to need to do to have a YouTube channel, 
is that I'm different than other people. Like what my dev like what I'm doing is much different than like every other airsoft channel out there. Like um, you see a lot of airsoft channels on YouTube that are people who just want to start one to do reviews and do gameplay, and you know that's cool and all. I mean, sure, that's awesome. But uh, there's so much review, like so many reviews, and there's so much gameplay out there that like it becomes, you're an undated as a viewer with so many things to choose from, so you pick the one with the most views, and that's unfortunately not the person starting out. So, I mean, that's one thing that I, I always, like, think, that, that I thought of when I thought of that, when I got that question. So, like, the thing is, for me, is, number one, do something different, because that's really the only way you can actually g gain a little bit of attention. Um, really know what you're talking about when you're talking about something different. Like, with teching, I've been teching for a very long, like, not a very long time, but a good chunk of time that I can say I know what I'm doing very well. I'm confident in my abilities, and I know what a good product is, I know what a good gun is, so I can go from there. And that's kind of what I've based my channel around, and since I know what I'm talking about there, it, you know, makes my channel better, because people are like, oh, this guy knows what he's talking about. So that's kind of what I think there. And then thirdly, um, uh, get good equipment. I, I know it's expensive, but I made a good drop of money. I, I made a good drop on uh, hardware and software. Like, I have a GoPro, which costs like $400. I have a Sony camcorder, which costs like $400, which isn't that great. It just kind of got me started. And then I have a, a nice laptop for editing, really nice editing software, Vegas Pro 13. And, um, I mean, I, I dropped cash on some stuff. So, like, that's also what's going to have to take. It's not a free thing to do, really. You really have to put a lot of time, effort, and money into it. And then the fourth thing is consistency. I know I suck at that recently because I've been everywhere, you know, on vacation. But consistency really is key. When people like a YouTube channel, say you've got all those three things down right there. You've got something different going for you, you know what you're talking about, and you've got the hardware and software to, you know, back it up. But you're not consistent. You only release a video, like, you know, once every three weeks or once every four or five weeks or you know once every whenever you feel like it because you know you're not too serious about it then people don't take you seriously because you're not taking yourself seriously so that's another huge thing for me I see a lot of YouTube like a lot of YouTubers the guys I like to watch are the guys that upload consistent cons consistently like every Monday Monday Wednesday and Friday they upload I try to upload every Wednesday and Friday even though that hasn't happened recently but I'm getting back onto that but I think that's one of the biggest key things to it because I'll actually get comments or emails from people saying like, hey man, I like your channel because you actually post videos. And so I'm like, huh, that's how people like my channel. So if that's what it takes, then I guess that's what it takes, I guess. But, uh, you know, starting on YouTube is, is super hard because there's so much competition. But if you can do the things like be different, know what you're talking about, um, have the hardware and software to really you know, put a lot of time into it to make it look good, I mean, my stuff doesn't look super good, but it does look good. Um, you know, good enough, I guess you could say. And then be consistent. You can really, really garnish a viewer base, and that's what I'm starting to get at. I mean, I have a sponsorship now. I have multiple media accounts, and they're all starting to get really, you know, good amount of attention, I think. And so I'm getting really pleased with it. And the reason why it's getting good attention is because I put the effort into steps one, two, three, and four. And uh, so that's why I believe I've been, you know, as well off on YouTube as I have been, which is not that great, to, I will say again, but it's better than a lot of other people that have tried. So that's my question and that's my answer. Yeah, I mean, basically I agree with everything you just said about that. So I also, with my, with my YouTube channel, I'm even smaller than Ryan is. I, I think I have more overall views than he does, which is I'm going to hold against him. That's the only thing I think I've beaten him with now. Um, but basically everything he said, I completely stand by. Um, I run my YouTube channel. I probably only have about a thousand, like thirteen hundred subs, maybe something like that. So a little, little more than half of what Ryan has. Um, and one of the things I'm not is I'm not consistent. Like what he said is, for me, YouTube is a very secondary thing. I like to put videos out. I enjoy making videos. I enjoy showing the community what I'm doing. But other things in my life take priority over it. And even other things in airsoft take priority over me making videos. Like a good example is my my, uh, my brother. Even I, I've had I, I've had a gameplay video from an op I went to months ago, and a complete loadout video that I've had stored on my computer for over 
But I've had these videos set up for over two months, and I haven't found the time to edit them and upload them yet. Um, this just goes to show, like, I, I enjoy using the YouTube channel, but it is a secondary thing for me. So if you are going into this and you really want to make it a primary thing and you really want to go all out on it, really, um, basically everything Ryan said, but the biggest thing has to be consistency because you can be a great YouTuber or you can be a great video editor. You can have great ideas. You can be great at pushing your videos and getting them known. But if you're only making them maybe once every two months and sometimes not even like that, like you might make two in a month, then you might go two months without making a video and stuff like that. People just aren't going to really follow your channel. Like what it gets down to is they'll still view your videos when they come out, but you're not going to have a consistent follow base. You're not going to be talked about. You're not going to gain that extra popularity of, oh, when when's the next Legacy Airsoft video coming out or when's the next the Airsoft Tech video coming out or um, kind of stuff like that. So, like, I mean... I think a lot of people, they want to immediately go from zero subscribers to, like, 50,000. and Because they, they don't know the work behind it. And then when they get started, they're, like, in, inundated with tons and tons of work, and they just don't know where to start. And so that's another problem with that I see a lot of people having, like, a new YouTube channel will launch, and they'll do really, like, make a lot of good videos, and they'll do this, this, and that. But then they'll lose, you know, their steam that they had for it originally, and then they'll just kind of die off. Because, you know... They realized it was a lot harder work than what they thought it was. That was and, me. <laughs> yeah, and, and, uh, no, <laughs> and they expected greater results than what they were going to get, and so that kind of let themselves down. Now, when I started my YouTube channel, I honestly wasn't really well like that. I didn't have, like, I didn't think I was going to get huge. I thought this was going to be something cool for me to do for customers, you know. I, I thought it would be kind of cool if the customer was like, you know, hey, that's really cool that my gun that this guy worked on has a you know a, a video of it, so whenever I wonder about my gun, I can just go check it out. And if I'm ever thinking about selling it, I can show it to the customer, and that's all I have to do. So that's kind of like one of the things I was planning on. Like The thing about my channel was is that it would really help out customers for me. But uh, when it started to grow more, I was like, huh, people actually want to know their, my opinion on like a certain part or a certain gun or like how to do this or how to do that. And so like... The most requested thing I get is how to, you know, a guide on how to shim. Like, that's that's one of the things I've gotten the most requests for. And, and Jacob has been, like, really... When I, was, when I was at his house, he kept, you know, messing with me about it. He said, you need to make it, like, now. And so, um, which he was he right. Should. Yeah, I, I really do. I really do need to. Because my AOE guide got a lot of views really fast. And a lot of people liked that guide. Because though it was long and a little, uh, you know, drawn out, it was still a really good guide, I thought. And a lot of people did, too. And if I just made a shimming guy with the same quality but a little bit shorter, then it would skyrocket. But I'm starting to get a little lazy and with my with my videos, which is starting to hurt me a little bit. So that's kind of like the problem there. But uh, I'm working on it, so that's what I'm doing. That's why I never started a YouTube channel. I knew I was lazy from the start. <laughs> <laughs> it really is a lot of hard work. And Beat the system. I, I am so lazy that, like, I really shouldn't be doing it, but I really wanted to at the same time. I was like, huh, it'd be really cool to have a small income on YouTube, or huh, it'd be really cool to have a small following on YouTube where people would actually want to meet me, or they'd want to, like, you know, see what I do, and that kind of stuff, you know? I always thought that kind of aspect of it was cool. Hmm. So that's... That's basically where I started mine. So I'm, I'm done. I feel like I took a long time on that, but yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Alright, one of the um, one of the questions I got on my Instagram today, actually, if I can try and find it. Um, this was a simple one. So this one was an easy one, but it was um, actually I'll skip that one because it's really literally stupid. But one of the one of the things I got is what is the best, not necessarily like the best base gun, but what's my favorite platform to buy. If I'm uh, buying a gun as a build gun, so if um, I'm not necessarily buying a gun to get it and use it out of the box, I'm buying a gun because I already have a build in mind that I want to use. And the question was specifically platform. It wasn't combat machine versus JG. It wasn't KWA versus GMP. It was what platform and. I, I don't want to say this because I want to be different, but I'm going to have to say the AR-15 M4 platform is always my go-to simply because I have so much experience with it and I know how it breaks down and I know all the modifications and I know what to check for and I know how to build those up the way I want to. 
like the back of my hand. Uh, you can give me a- any brands. Um, M4 platform, I will like some much better than others, but w- with any of them, it, I-, I know how to attack it so easily that 99% of the time, if I had to pick a gun, like specifically for a build, that would be the gun that I pick probably. Uh, I'll try to keep it shorter because we are we are going way over time. I bet. Let me check. Um, we are. It's like almost two hours. We're at a mi- We're at an hour fifteen. For the actual. All right. That's, that's an hour. Bad, actually. That's an hour and fifty, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure. Hour and fifty one. I'm sorry. You're okay. with Dexic. <laughs> anyway. Right, well, yeah, we'll get back to that. So what? <laughs> What do um, what do you guys think is your favorite platform to buy for a project gun? Without a doubt, M4. I'm not even ashamed to say that. That's just yeah. that's the platform I like. Like I didn't want to say that because I wanted to be different, but like I knew that was the one I was gonna well, pick. Well, I, c- I can have M4s and still be different. Like that's that's part of the reason why most of the builds I do is like I'm not I'm not one of those people who has like a lot of airsoft guns. Like right now I have five airsoft guns total, and the thing about me is whenever I do a build I completely trick them out like i don't think anybody well i won't say that but the vast vast majority of people aren't going to have guns that are similar to mine whether it be external or internal um like that jp rifle for example a lot of people don't have those kits anymore um oh, I internally i have i have one rifle with a pro in gearbox you know you don't see that too often i try to make mine different you know in ways that i can that just kind of makes me feel special makes my rifle special but even as far as like Actually using the platform, yes, I prefer the M4 platform. Yeah, um, I prefer the Barrett 50 cal platform, superior. <laughs> it's, li- it's literally it's an M4. If, if, I, Barrett shell. if I had to choose one, I honestly, like, are we talking like like the way the internal is set up and, and the external setup, or are we just talking pure platform externally? Um, both. I'm, I'm M4 for both. Okay, yeah, okay. I, Honestly, I really, really like the SO25 setup, but it's hard to say I like it more than the version 2 M4 setup. Just because, like, both of them are versatile. One can just, like, has has more air, like, pressure behind it. And the 19 tooth pit, like, the, the, the 19 tooth setup's really cool. So, it's a really, it's, to, it's a coin toss. I like both of those a lot. I can honestly say part of the reasoning why I like the V2 platform better is because you honestly do have more options with it since it is, like, overall the more popular platform with most people. There's a lot more aftermarket parts made for it. There's a lot more external parts made for it. You know, there are a lot more, as far as, like, brands that make them, there are a lot more companies that make them. You just have more options. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing for me, too, is where... The M4 naturally is just the most popular airsoft gun out there. It has the most parts for it internally. It's what you see the most. It's what you work on the most. It's it's what you... Like, if you were in airsoft, especially at tech, and you haven't worked on an M4, it's a very, very rare case. Like, it's just... It's one of those things where everyone has it. It's so common. It's so easy to pick up how it works and how to know. It, like, becomes the back of your hand just how to work on those things. I wonder, I wonder if there's a tech that doesn't. I wonder if there's a tech that doesn't work on M4s. Like he just, he's like, yeah, I only work on G36s no. and AKs. Well, that would be kind of ridiculous, seeing as how like they're one of the easiest platforms to work on. <laughs> I, I only work on V3s, nothing else. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to take my gun to that tech. I don't know what he'd be doing. He'd be teching underneath a rock. Probably. Yeah. Because you're, you're not going to have an, like, you're not going to have teching as a profession without working on a V2 at some point. Right. But that's the thing, like, we even said M4s, but just the whole, like, for example, if you were to buy an um, ACR or a SCAR, um, they both use basically identical setups internally to an M4, save for the hop-up design. Or even a Barrett. If it's the classic army design, you have to shave off the front of the gearbox. Um, The Barrett 50 cals, (laughs) at least the Snow Wolf ones, they're literally an M4 on the inside. They just have a different outside. They, they, They just don't look like an M4. Um, so, even though the M4 is probably still my favorite platform to use, just because it's so simple and I'm so used to it, the internal setup for the M4 and actually working on it can be replaced with 
it, like you, it's still that simple on other guns. Like you don't have to get an M4 to get that easy to work on internal setup. I think that's also a big benefit too. Is like my first airsoft AEG was a scar because I knew the internal setup was easy to work on, but I didn't want to buy an M4 like everyone else had. Um, my second one was an ACR. It again, it had the same internal setup as the M4. It was just as easy to work on. Might have been a bitch to open up, but like once you got to the gearbox, it was just as easy to work on. But it didn't look like an M4 like everyone else. Um, granted, the next three I bought were a uh, 416, a, an M4, and an SR25. So I, I kind of graduated toward that AR platform eventually. But like, you you can get the simple internals and that nice design that's really really popular among all the brands without having an M4 externally. And I think that's what the kid who asked the question was kind of hoping I wouldn't say M4 because he wanted to see what else was out there. But um, from a text perspective, that is like that is my answer. Um, but if you really don't want to, if you really want different externals, like you can still get the same internal compatibility with other guns that are out there, which is always good. All right. Well, Jacob, your turn. Oh boy. Uh, well, I don't have that same social following that you guys have I generally try not to put myself out there like that because again I'm, I'm a lazy person <laughs> but uh, like today for example I guess one one good example of a question would be on uh, teching Q&A I saw one person ask a question about uh, how do I get started in teching you know how do I you know begin that first step into actually learning how to work on my own gun and all that and honestly my my own opinion on it is I would definitely go to Google first. Like, a lot of people use that as a first resort, and they're just thinking, you know, oh, well, you're not actually trying to help them, you know. The best way for you to learn something is to do it yourself. Whenever I got started teching, I I didn't even use Google or, or YouTube or anything. I had an airsoft gun. I was just like, I was that kid that liked to tinker with his own toys, you know. I was just like, I'm going to take this apart, and I'm going to fix this. It was like an old JGM4 that was broken. Honestly, don't even remember what the problem with it was, but I... Uh, Long story short, I ended up not being able to fix it at that time, but after, you know, using Google and stuff, you know, after researching a while, watching a bunch of YouTube videos on how to take gearboxes apart, uh, I ended up getting another gun by that time. It was this Matrix SR-16, which was honestly a total piece of junk, but uh, what I ended up doing was I took apart both of those guns and I made a single working gun out of the two, and I was really proud of that because... You know, that was 100% through my own hard work that I learned how to work on a gearbox and actually assemble those those two gearboxes together and make one. And so that's that's basically the best advice I could give is just keep doing research. You know, keep using the forums are a really good way to start out. Uh, yeah, just search stuff. See, like, uh, I find it really cool. I just went to Google and I looked up how does an airsoft gun work. And the first thing I get are, you know, several videos and several images. And then below that I get several links to websites to, like... I'm sure are talking about how the gun works. And so just from that, you can see like, huh, this thing doesn't look as complex as what I thought it was, and now that I have a basic understanding, I'm going to look up a guide on how to take mine apart now. So, like, you can really jump around if you just kind of aren't lazy, you know? Like, there's, there's different types of laziness I see here. Like, one lazy is kind of like our tech lazy, where we're just like, eh, and we'll do it later kind of thing. Like, we won't correct AOE and our DSG on field because, eh, kind of lazy, and that takes too long. And then there's the other type of lazy, where you're looking at someone who is, like, literally wants to be spoon-fed. That they want to ask a question and get the answer right there. They don't want to have to go look around for it and do their own research because, you know, their time is just somehow worth more than your time. So me explaining it to them is just better off to them because they don't have to go look around. And yeah. so um, when Jacob says go to Google, it literally isn't that hard. Just type in how does an airsoft gun work, watch a video, and then type in how do I take apart so and so gun, you know, and then go from there. Watch it a couple times, feel comfortable, and then go for it. I mean, sure, you you may you may not be able to get it back together, but you made the choice, and now you're learning from it. So I mean, just do research, you know, and uh, gain experience that way. It's really not that hard. And if you come across a situation in which something may be that you're not like too sure about, like you're getting different, you know, information about, then ask a question because it's gonna get some a answers that aren't like, you know, super long or a super big waste of time to some people. Because people actually want to answer questions that are intelligent and that are like controversial. They don't want to answer questions like, how do I start to tech? Because it's really just up to you. Yeah, and 
just to add on to what Ryan said about the whole, like, doing your own research and kind of getting out there, I mean, that's how we all started, all three of us talking to you right now. It was, we had a gun that we, that it was either broken or we wanted to make better, and we didn't know how. We decided not to pay someone else to do it, learn how to do it ourselves, and eventually that the, the, the Basically, the interest we had either guided us to YouTube videos, a forum. Um, nowadays, it might even be on Facebook learning this stuff. But, like, it kind of just taught us how to go. It's, it's so easy to learn. Like, some people think that it's some mystical land where only some random privileged people happen to have the knowledge. But literally, I just typed in while Ryan was talking into my Google search bar how to build a high-speed airsoft gun. Like, there's no technical knowledge in that. You don't even know how, you don't need to know anything at all except for the fact that you want to build a high-speed airsoft gun. Type that in Google. The very first result that pops up, airsoftsociety.com, Legacy's Guide to Building a High-Speed Airsoft AEG. Shameless like, plug. Are, it's, it's so easy to find these things. Now, granted, that's a guide I wrote, so like I knew that it would pop up if I, <laughs> if I started just in Google, but... My point is that I, I went to the Google search bar, which every one of you listening has. I typed in the most generic thing I could think of, how to build a high-speed airsoft gun. And the very first thing that popped up was a, like, four or five-page guide explaining how you can do this. And, like, like the information's out there. It's so easy to find. You just have to actually be willing to go and find it and not just kind of sit back and just accept the fact that you don't know how to do it and that it's too hard. Something you said that uh, um, kind of caught my attention was that you said that, like, teching is in uh, some sort of mystical land. It's not some special, like, esoteric group of people that can do it. Like, part of that is kind of true, honestly. Because you need to have a mechanical mindset to work on these guns. And like you know, do this, do like 60 RPS builds to them. Sure, you don't need to have like some advanced mechanical knowledge to get your gun back together and correct AOE and that kind of stuff. But this kind of stuff does require some mechanical, you know, sense, I guess you could say. And not everybody has that, so they have to work a little bit harder at it. And I've seen people like that, that you know, they don't have the mechanical sense that others do, and that they're still gun ho for teching, and then they eventually get it by learning through trial and error. And then you get those that you know they just kind of catch on real quick because you know, they have that mechanical sense, and so, um, you know, if you don't have mechanical sense, you know, oh well, you just have to work a little harder at it, but, you know, that's just how life is, I guess you could say. Yeah, I mean, like, it is true, though, like, so, I, I remember back when I started, I was, I want to say 11 years old, maybe 12 years old, when I first started researching how to tech airsoft guns. Obviously, I had absolutely no background knowledge at all in anything mechanical, electrical. I didn't know what physics was. I didn't know that the physics was a word. Like, I just, I, I, I owned an airsoft gun, and I wanted to make it better. So I went on YouTube. I went on Google. I eventually found forums, such as um, Airsoft Society was the big one that I ended up going on a lot. But I also found Airsoft Mechanics, which was over my head at the time. But I later revisited, and I frequent that forum now. Um, there's nothing really on Facebook when I was around, but now if you were to go on Facebook, there's the one question, one answer group. Um, that's pretty active. There are, there are other small groups on Facebook as well. Uh, like, like it's, it's so easy to get involved in a community and to start learning about this stuff. You just, like, literally you have to just take the first step and do it yourself. Um, like, like I said, I was, e I can't remember exactly, I was either 11 or 12 years old when I started to watch YouTube videos on how does an airsoft gun work? What are the parts in an airsoft gun? How does the D-Voice Scar L be taken apart? And you just, like, you, you keep getting into it, you keep learning it, and as you start learning, you'll, you'll realize, all right, is this something I can do in my understanding? Is this something I want to keep looking into? And if it is, awesome. You, you naturally keep going. You keep learning more. You keep absorbing more. Um, and if it's not, if it's way over your head, well, now you're at a crossroad. You can, you can give up if you want to. You can just resort to having other tech work in your guns, or you can say, it's something that I want to, I want to get at it. I want to learn. I want to keep going. You just keep Rewatching those videos, you keep rereading those guides, you keep talking and asking questions on the forums until eventually it clicks and you start to put the pieces together. Um, and to be completely honest with you, it's not hard. I do agree with Ryan, you do need some sort of mechanical mindset to kind of grasp these concepts sometimes, but if a 12-year-old 
can start learning airsoft teching and eventually get to the point where I am today, five years later, anyone can do it. Like, obviously, I didn't have a mechanical mindset back then. I was just driven by curiosity. Like, all you really need to do is have a willingness to, like, learn and actually apply what you're learning to what you own. Like, work on your own airsoft guns. Buy a boneyard airsoft gun. Buy a broken one. See if you can fix it up and tech it yourself. See if you can figure out what's wrong. And if you can't, go to YouTube and forums. Go to Facebook. Ask the questions. Try to figure it out on your own. Look up what's wrong. And oftentimes, even if you don't figure out what's wrong, you'll learn a lot more about the other pieces of the gun, which then you come back and use that knowledge later. Um, so, like, like the, the real, like, the first step is just wanting to learn and wanting to do it. And that's, that's what I would tell someone is that, like, if you're trying to get into it, just start researching. And it, it's so easy yeah. with the internet. And it's like that point you raised, you know, go buy a Boneyard Airsoft gun, see if you can fix it. And having the ability to work on an Airsoft gun honestly opens up a whole new world as far as, like, in the world of Airsoft to you. Because you just, say, let's say you just bought a Boneyard JGM for, you know, you don't want to know what's wrong with it. Say you bought it for fifty dollars and that's almost you know what like a hundred and forty dollar gun i think off the top yeah. of my head i'm not sure you know okay. you just bought it for fifty dollars oh it turns out it was just a strip piston you spend maybe fifteen ten fifteen dollars on a new piston whatever kind that was you you have now have uh, sixty five dollars invested in a hundred and forty five dollar gun you know congratulations you have a whole new gun now you could sell it you can use it you know it just gives you that many more options right I do like how a lot of techs have similar uh, uh, pasts and like similar desires. It's it's really kind of cool. Um, each one of us are going into mechanical engineering, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah there there you go. Like that's something that we just like airsoft has kind of introduced us to that. I guess you could say. I, I wouldn't have gone into mechanical mechanical engineering if I wouldn't have gotten into airsoft. I guarantee it because I had other mindsets back then. Like I had a mechanical sense. I guess you could say potential and all that kind of stuff. But I never really thought of it like that. Like, when I was young, I used to love Legos. Like, holy crap. And Jacob Woo! does, too. Yeah, right there. <laughs> so I'm not really sure about Ryan, but uh, a lot of just... <laughs> we have, like, weird, you know, similar things. And that's kind of like the psychology of it, which is really kind of cool. Um, a lot of techs just have similar interests. And that's just kind of cool to think about, really. So I always thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, I think I was always, like, the mechanically inchi inclined child. Yeah. But, like Ryan said, you know, I have a lot of Legos. I used to I used to take apart my RC cars just to kind of take them apart. I used to take apart my Xbox 360 controllers just to take them apart. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty, pretty much just how it went. Yeah. But, uh... That's yeah, I, I was never the uh, I was never the biggest Lego nerd. I did have... I do have a bunch of them, actually. And me and my best friend used to build, like... <laughs> my uh, my best friend and I used to go and build all like those Star Wars replica ships and things like that. We we get the kit, sit down and work on it. But like my first real venture, I guess, into what I would call like the mechanical world or like building things, putting things together, was airsoft guns. Like if I never owned that airsoft gun and I never decided one day that I wanted to make it better and I wanted to learn how I can do it myself. I honestly, like, I'm applying to a bunch of mechanical engineering colleges right now. Like, that's what I want to do when I'm going to college. And I can honestly say that if I never bought my first airsoft gun and decided I wanted to tech on it, I don't think I would be in the same position I am now. Um, so, like, it actually is something, in my case, that has affected my life in, like, a huge way. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm deciding what I want to study in college be, like, I am who I am. I, I'm going to college to study what I want to study because when I was 11 years old, I bought an airsoft gun. Like, like you never think that like these random little things you would do would have such an impact on your life. Right. It's just kind of a cool thing to think about. I always thought I just like, huh? That's kind of weird that uh, Jacob is going to mechanical engineering and I am too. I wonder why? Because they're both techs, you know, kind of thing. And same thing when I was uh, heard you were going to mechanical engineering. I was like, huh? That even more supports my, uh, you know, kind of theory i guess you could say just most techs go into some sort of engineering like i've just noticed that so it's really kind of cool you know we were we're hands-on kind of people and so uh that's just who we are and uh just really cool i always thought you know i always think back on that kind of stuff and you know in a philosophy kind of philosophical kind of way so 
But I guess that kind of brings us to the end of this podcast. So we've been going on this podcast for about an, a- an hour and 35 minutes. Uh, our, Skype's, our Skype call says two hours and 21 minutes because uh, we uh, were lazy. Go figure. Trying to get started. So uh, go figure. Oh, that does make sense. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because we, well, I mean, we've been Skyping for about two and a half hours, but we haven't been recording for two and a half hours. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, oh well, but that's gonna have to bring that's gonna bring us to the end of uh, Airsoft Mechanics podcast. This is episode nine. Here we have Jacob Bell as our guest, and uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say. I guess um, it's been a while since we did one of these, but we're back on a weekly schedule. <laughs> Finally, hopefully. Hopefully. Hopefully college doesn't just destroy us. Yeah. Well, we'll see. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. <laughs> hope for the best. <laughs> we, we, we hope to be back for more than, like, two weeks and then leave again. Yeah, trust me. We're, we're not going to go into another ice age, I hope. I hope. So, uh, yeah, but we will see you guys later. See you guys. Bye. Peace. Alrighty, cool. That is the podcast. Yeah, it's 1 a.m.